Welcome to the Love Cars on the Grid podcast, your global motorsport roundup with me, Tiffany Dell and Paul Woodman. Welcome to Love Cars on the Grid, your global motorsport podcast roundup on the grid today. Mad Max is back. Oh, we're going to look into that a little bit more as we an- uh, analyse the controversial Austrian Grand Prix and we celebrate British winners in Formula 1, Formula 2 and Formula 3. Plus we've got MotoGP from Holland, uh, more di- Dutch disappointment. We've got World Rally Championship, another win for the part-timers. It's funny these guys just turn up and win <laughs> and Aston Martin win the Spa 24 hours. And it was a wild ride for the boys at NASCAR in Nashville, but... Let's kick off with the news. Uh, and it all looked like another easy weekend for Max yeah. Verstappen. He did do very well. He was, as yeah. always, a phenomenal with the qualifying sprint race. Sprint race. And then. What was it? It was 0.4 <laughs> quick in pole for the main race. It just looked like there was going to be another Red Bull ring board, didn't it? I mean, it just, you know, it was just going to be another walk in the park and then all of a sudden things began to unravel well let's and, look at um, let's look oof. at the qualifying let's look at the qualifying first and it was uh again no great uh surprises perez just struggles and the difference now with perez there was always a big difference but the difference now that other people have caught up red bull other manufacturers caught up red bull mm. that gap is really showing because he used to hide in second and third place and it, on paper, it looked okay that he was doing okay because the Red Bull was so dominant. But now the Red Bull isn't as dominant. Right. It's still very dominant. It's hard to drive. I mean, that's where Max is brilliant. You know, Max has been carrying that bloody Red Bull. It's obviously keeps on upsetting him. Well, Perez just can't do that. I mean, he qualified seventh for sprint and finished eighth. <laughs> he just didn't even move forwards in the sprint. <laughs> and um, so he was seventh on the grid for the Grand Prix and he... He was trying to get, we'll go, it's the Grand Prix, we mentioned it now, talking about Perez, you know, and then he was desperately trying to take, what was it, sixth place off of uh, Hulkenberg house and couldn't do it. I mean, Perez, why are they signed him? What? I mean, just well, unreal. I don't know anybody. We, we mix in the sort of same circles. People have opinions of just normal folk like us and then people that work in the industry. And nobody can understand why. The only logical answer is the sponsorship. But still, it just doesn't make much sense to me. Well, let's, not, let's just get straight to the point, yeah. I think. Let's not look at any of them. <laughs> let's just look at the stuff that everyone's talking about. Um, on Twitter, of course, Yeri's mates, Yeri, <laughs> Yeri won't be happy with this podcast. A week ago, you were saying, was your flipping headline when you said, is Max Verstappen the nicest man in Formula One? I said, yes, he's a lovely character. We love his straight up talking about Las Vegas, talk straight up about the racing. We like that. We like his character. And I just pointed out to you, I think, in the podcast, but yeah, let, let's just wait and see until he's got someone competitive. And he, because he's had such a lovely... He can afford to be lovely on track at the moment because he's never been raced by anybody. Um, I've already had Twitter saying, you know, oh, remember the 51G crash that anyone else would have killed Silverstone. They're already, they're already harking back. Any criticism of Max, it's like the Yerries seem to think we're holding a grudge from 2021. Um, we're not Yeris. We've moved on. Um, and then everyone's mentioning, oh, uh, Lando squeezed Max off the grid at Barcelona. A little bit. I mean, put Max almost on the edge of the track into a bit of dust, which is quite a normal run down to first quarter sort of racing. Um, but we're just concentrating, Yeri and everybody else, not on 2021, not on 51Gs at Silverstone. We're talking about moving under braking. Simple as that. We're just going to a straightforward regulation that was introduced after a lot of the dive bombing, which Max's overtaking style was very aggressive when he began. There's a lot of controversy. Um, and they said, well, look, we cannot move under braking to defend these late lunges because that's what's just, dangerous. Can I just go back to that point you just made? Because this rule was literally written because of Max. This yeah. was literally yeah. written because of Max was happening. Yeah. So the rule is you cannot overtake, you cannot move in the braking zone. Because, you know, when these cars are coming from what, 180, 200 miles an hour down to 60 miles an hour in, in about 100 yards, and if you've got your front wheel, suddenly there's a rear wheel comes across in front of your front wheel, you're going to have an aircraft accident if it gets wrong, if that move is too late. Mm. You know, it's a very, very, very dangerous thing to do with the speed of these cars. And, you know, the first, you know, instance was, the, was the, I think you had three lunges, Lando, you know, but the one in particular that um, Anthony Davison picked out 
you know, he pointed out as a racing driver, Yeri, not me saying or Paul saying, um, that you break just after the 100 metre board. And he had that perfect onboard of Max's car. Uh, Max had gone past the 100 metre board on the white line, on the left-hand edge of the track. And as soon as we were watching Lando behind, Lando moved for that overtake. Woof! Max moved away from the line in about the 50-yard. But he's not turning into the corner. He's responding to what yeah. Lando's done. And that's what is banned. Um, and that's why McLaren was so upset because Max wasn't given any warning for that. So the problem is that when you do that, of course, that narrowed Lando's line. So Lando's now got to go further inside, which makes the corner sharper, which means he locks up the brakes and ran off the road. Um, we come to the moment where another of those inside lunges actually worked because he completed the manoeuvre. He was ahead of Max's front wheels, front wheel to front wheel at the apex. Therefore, it was now he was now in the lead. He didn't go off the track on that third attempt, whereas Max just ran off off the track and came back on the track. But how him. did he not give that place back? How that's, was he exactly? Not well, that's told rule number two. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. That's so. First of all, he's moving under braking, proved by factual cameras. He's moving in reaction to Lando's move. Ah, 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 ah. As, but Max says that he's <laughs> different to every other driver ever that's existed on the planet, and he breaks when he's uh, turning the wheel. Yeah, but you don't to know that you can't react. I mean, it, it, Max on the radio at one stage you, to to um, Horner, Christian Horner, who's all, oh, yes, Max, no, you know. And Max, I think he said, he's just dive bombing me. Well, that's exactly Max's overtaking style when he was racing, <laughs> when he didn't have the best guy. He was a brilliant dive bomber himself, but he sometimes dive bombed so much that he was taking himself on through it. You know, and um, Horner said, yeah, it's a joke, Max, and yeah, it's a joke, Max. Um, so then we had that. That, that was nauseating. Manoeuvre. I have to say, the radio comms yeah. between Max and his team were nauseating. It's so well, the one at the end, I've got, so... yeah. End, end of the race when he, when, he, when Christian said, "Oh, I think you ought to know you had a ten second penalty for that incident." To which Max replied, um, "Before he got, he said, oh, Max, it was ridiculous." Yeah, ridiculous. I know, it's r ridiculous. Um, and then I think Horner replied, and "said you know, yeah, he wasn't behaving correctly." Talking about Lando not behaving correctly. So it's that the two of them sort of urge each other on to sort of come up with these ridiculous, we're all innocent, we're all innocent. But let's come to the final one, the clash. And again, there's the, again Anthony Davis had all the cameras. He was brilliant. Hours. His analysis yeah, was absolutely perfect. went yeah. through it. And, um, you know, Max went to defend. He thought another lunge was coming up the inside. Lando did a brilliant down the outside. Well, you have to leave a car's width worth of room. <laughs> and right, the, you know, when the when the when the, the clash happened, Lando and his left hand wheels off the track, you know, they're over the white line. You know, it's just it was all, you know, that's why he got a 10 second penalty, which we're not sure that's quite enough. Well, it's not um, enough, but that's that, again, if you want to be a stickler to the rules, stickler to the rules, that that is the, the rule, is 10 second penalty. It's, it's so yeah. people are saying that you should punish him because uh, Lando couldn't finish the race. That's not really what it's about. So you win some, you lose some. So, yeah. but he's, no, it's just about it, being it is, strong. It is harsh. It is, you and it's the FIA's move. fault in in so many ways because yeah. you know, twenty twenty one, he, 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 everyone said, "Oh, this hard, well, yeah, the the yeah, the good hard racing is amazing. Max is good hard racing." But actually, the reality is, he he's like a lot of there's. You always get it in club racing as well. There's one or two people that were prepared to risk their cars and smash your car up. To, to to make the place or to save the place and he's one of those and now yeah. people it looks like lando is and Charles leclerc for uh he did it for a while as well when he was competing he was prepared to say do you know what if you are going to do it then we're going to hit yeah you can't and that goes it. wrong it gets it worse they've yeah. got to really the FIA should have done something about it and they, yes for so many years they should have and they're so are they are, am i am i blinkered because i've never been a big max certainly not a perez fan in the past but are they blinkered? Am I blinkered with Red Bull? Are they? It, mm. Because it just seems they are so scared stiff about Red Bull and and upsetting the the apple cart with Red Bull. But if I'm if I'm blinkered with that, then I'll I'll accept it. Yeah. No, I think we just have to go for that. You know, just go for the moving under breaking law. And Max broke it several times, well, twice at least, very badly. And uh, if they can't accept that at Red Bull, that's the saddest thing. about Lando says, you know, he apologizes to me. You know, we can move on. But they won't. They're so arrogant. <laughs> well, it's, they it's, it's, you know, Max said so it's ridiculous. They're ridiculous. And and Lando... Horner says, yeah, he wasn't driving correctly. No, he wasn't. Oh. 
That is very good. The McLaren man, he's been very calm and explaining the rules and saying this can't be allowed to continue, that they must come down upon it. Andreas but Stella, some, yeah, his, he, he did a little interview. Haven't seen yeah. it. Have a, have a little Google. It's so good. Yeah, he, so calm, reasoned. Was calm. He, but he was equally, he was frustrated and he was he, he, he had that uh, uh, just such disappointment in his voice and his face yeah. as well. But you say, how can he keep getting away with this? He's been doing it for so many years. This is the, and, and this is the thing that we're told not to do. And then he does it. Max did it on the exact same corner in 2000. Uh, he did a few years ago with well, it is, uh, Charles Leclerc. It is he a corner, bomb. because don't forget um, uh, Rosberg versus Hamilton, same corner. I mean, yes. It is a corner that, that attracts a late lunge. Well, it's a funny and little track, I think, isn't it? And Hamilton ran Rosberg wide a bit. And then, you know, it's that running. The other, you know, cheat is to run people wide. But so if, anyway, if I mean, all, we, you, all you want in any sport is consistency. That's all you yeah. want. And there doesn't seem to be the consistency. And, and FIA, I know you change your stewards. I know the race directors change. But uh, but you just want consistency. Or announce that from now, look, we've got to clamp down on this. We've got to be more consistent. <sighs> but Anthony was... David sitting in the, in the stewards' room every time. But the trouble is, you know, he's got all that feedback. He can analyse it. It's yeah, very so hard they, to make a quick they've judge. They've got more well, data than Anthony. They've got, the, they've got the proper data from each team. So they know exactly yeah. the moment he decels or breaks or, or whatever. So they've got exactly that. One person that was very happy was a man called George Russell. <laughs> let's, let's move on. Right, We'll move away from that, Yeri. Now you can start writing your complaints oh, yeah, to yeah, our Yeri, biased... Yeri, you got... You, you know, this is just ridiculous because every week... Yeah, I, Gary, I literally were warming to Max so much <laughs> with his personality, and then you were absolutely bang on the moment he gets in a bit of uh, the old Max is back competition. Mm. Max is back. Yeah, yeah. If Yeri, if you can't accept that that was <laughs> Max's fault, then we completely give up. He won't you? accept it. They don't. But yeah, so George, George. Uh, and came for those through. of you who don't know who Yeri is, by the way, um, very lovely chap that <laughs> leaves us a message about Max Verstappen every week on our YouTube. So uh, I long you. messages, very long messages, hard, hard to understand messages. Um, yeah, so let's go back to the, the, the fun, the podium, a hugely smiling podium. I love the fact that George Russ, George has worked so hard. With that rubbish Mercedes, that it is getting better and better, but he still drives the bollocks off it every lap he does when it's qualifying or racing. He just gives everything, and so he was the one that was, you know, sitting there and inherited the win, which was great for him. And uh, I think Oscar Piastri was pretty happy, um, and no, so was Sainz. You know, no, Piastri wasn't he after the race. No, he, no. he, 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 gen he that was the one that got away for him and because he, really, he lost his qualified position. Yeah, he really well, thought. Was, well, we, yeah. I was going to come on to that. I said, well, they was happy in the, in the Grand Prix. I didn't realize. And they, and they had the virtual Grand safety Prix. car towards the end when he was catching George and and on slightly fresher tires, I believe. So you know, he really thinks that was his. Well, that gave George. Go, yeah. to, uh, to give George a bit of rest. A cushion. Yeah. Yeah, because Oscar, of course, we you know we've got to talk track limits. We have to talk track limits because they came up with this brilliant idea. Even even I hadn't thought of it. So it's that brilliant. Because <laughs> so I've always said narrow curb. I always said gravel trap and a narrow curb. So that if the outside wheels go in the gravel, the front wheels are off the track. So it was a very simple way of working out who was, who was off track. But of course, then you've got this huge sea of gravel and everyone spins off, they're stuck in the gravel and you've got to train, crane them out. And then this little trench of gravel, well, if you go over the top of it, you're back on, on hard standing and therefore you don't get stuck and you can rejoin the race having lost half a second or a second or two. Um, and it was brilliant, except at turn six. So <laughs> they made it 1.5 metres from the white line, the grey of the track, to the gravel trench on those two most critical last corners. And so as soon as you're in the gravel, you were off the track. It was brilliant. But for some reason, at turn six, they made it 1.8 metres. So now you've got to be really in the gravel before you're off the track. So some people, and Lewis lost the lap time in the sprint quali there. And I think it's February the Formula 2 and Formula 3. And of course, Oscar did it in the main qualifying. Because now, you know, he thought he was just kissing the gravel if he was all right. But because it was a 1.8 metres, in fact, his inside tyres had gone across the white line, which he didn't really realise. The whole great thing about the trench is, you know that if you're in it, Oh, You've exceeded track no, limits. No excuse. No, that yeah, one corner. Why no, did they make it one point okay, eight meters? Yeah, I agree. Maybe, maybe for the consistency, but it's no excuse. See, you're the driver. You know where the track is. You know where the white. Well, line is. You don't, I'm not going that speed. <laughs> I know you talk about you. You'll come up with a catering story, Mark. In my catering, <laughs> I know you're doing about fifty miles an hour. 
with bicycle, where you can see the bottom of your front tires looking out the side of your cage while you put your goggles, your Beagle's goggles on. When you're doing twice the speed, you give me with, ten million a year in a Formula One car, be one of the best drivers in the world, and say, "Oh yes, very hard. you only you only know if you're going to hit the gravel because it's one point eight meters away." Rubbish. Then you know where the gravel is. You know oh. there's a line because you see the gravel. So instead of seeing the gravel line, you see the white line at the edge of the track. I don't buy that one. So anyway, uh, very much top ten, top five teams filling the top ten um, in qualifying. Uh, I think in the, in the main Grand Prix qualifying, there was um, what Gasly didn't make the top 10 and Hulkenberg did. Haas having a very good weekend. Mm. Um, but Aston Martin still nowhere, nobody else anywhere. But um, So it's very much having the top five teams up in the top 10 quite regularly at the moment. Um, track limits obviously killed Oscar. That ruined his race. Full. I mean, he, he started seventh, so he did pretty well to get up to where he was, let alone thinking he should have got the win. I didn't read that interview or hear that interview. Um, so George with Piastro, yeah. What else I've made notes of? Happy Hop podium. Haas, Haas six and eight. I mean, they've really yeah, had a good time at the moment. Perry's in the middle of them. Uh, <laughs> Ricardo ninth, out qualifying Yuki yeah. and finishing ahead of him. So he's still saying, I want that job. I want that job. I don't know what they're going to do. I think I read, I haven't followed that story. Hasn't science now been rejected by Williams or told Williams he's not going to be with them? He's oh, closed I one. I think he's closed a door to Williams. Okay. I read, so I don't know who's... Oh, I keep on forgetting Ocon's hanging around needing a drive as well, isn't he? So Ocon and Sainz. Would you, and, would, um, would you of course, Valtteri, Ocon, Valtteri has got lots of offers. Valtteri's been offered lots of choices. But... Do you know how many points Valtteri Bottas on this year so far? No. Nil point. Um, oh, but he's beating his teammate. Oh, that was the interview I saw today. Yeah, <laughs> very happy because he's be he's beating his very average Chinese teammate. I won't go there. So, would you employ uh, very, would you employ Ocon as a team leader? Team, oh, yeah, I, I think he's more or less on the list. Well, he certainly had a Bottas. He's fa- he, um, yeah, he's fast. Uh, he's actually quite consistent, but he's um, he's hot headed though, isn't he? He's not a team know. player. Well, this is the trouble. You need a team player. You'd wonder, is it just because he's Gasly? Because they've never liked each other, apparently. So I don't know. It's the Gasly that makes makes him burn. So an entertaining Grand Prix for all the wrong reasons. Um, controversy back, and it's good to have it because we like a bit of uh, battling going on up front. Silverstone's up next. I'm sure the 51 G crash will be mentioned again by Rieri's mates when Lewis had a bit of a tap. So looking forward to Silverstone this weekend. So the support races, British winners. Um, Ollie Behrman has been struggling to make this Prima um, car work. Pretty embarrassing when you're, you know, the hottest shot on the planet and about to go to a Formula One car. Well, the two hottest shots in, in um, I know. Well, Formula well, Two. Yeah, and to make it worse. I mean, Ollie's, Ollie's leading the battle of making a Prima go quicker. But he was only the ninth quickest, uh, which made him a front row start for the sprint race, which he won in supreme style. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I liked it, even um, Ollie. You know, when the Prima people were going one wow wow over the radio, he actually said, like I would just say, yeah, we, okay, it was only a sprint race, boys, you know, but it's still good to win. Um, so Ollie, but in the main race, he 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 was battling well for the, he was actually running second on an alternative tire strategy in the main race. And then I don't know what his problem was, but he retired the car. Antonelli qualified 16th and finished 15th in the sprint race. Um, and today he finished thirteenth in the main race after having a really delayed pit stop. He stalled it. And they couldn't get they couldn't get the start of motor. It looked a real shambles at Prima. Um, so the what was the sprint race was won by Behrman. That was good, a bit of fun, but not a main race. Main race. There was a really good main race actually because they always have this this alternative strategy, don't they? So the first ten on the grid always go for the softer tyres. So the first laps they can sprint away and race, and the second ten go for the a harder alternative. But um, Franco Colapinto, that qualified fourth, the Argentinian driver, he started on the, it was actually a soft tyre, just to confuse us, but it was harder than the super soft. And he stayed out on the soft tyre for ages and was leading. Behrman was on the straight, same strategy, not staying with Colapinto, dropping back a bit. Um, but then, as usual, you thought, well, when he changes and gets his super softs on, he'd be miles down the grid and he won't catch up. But he did. He put on the super softs and was challenging for the lead on about the last lap. We couldn't quite get there. So had a really good second place. So it was a good Formula 2 race. It's often that strategy split makes it so confusing. You don't really yeah. know who's leading you know, for half the race. Colapinto was leading for like two-thirds of the race. So until he goes into the pits, until you find out where he's going to come back out again, you've no idea really who's on the best strategy. 
Um, it was a good, it was a Brazilian's first win, Gabriel Bortoletto, Formula 3 champion from last year, very highly hyped, very highly regarded. Um, Alonso is his team manager, so he's got a good contact, and he's a McLaren development driver. So he qualified third and had a good win in the, in the feature race. So got some good Formula 2 action and good Formula 3 action. Again, with a British Another win. British this winner. Time, this time, the main race was dominated by um, Luke Browning. So we've now got this queue of, you know, Luke, one of the autosport winners, I think, wasn't he, a couple of years back, um, from pole position, dominated the race, led all the way. So, you know, we're talking about our, our mates, fast Freddie Slater, there's Arvin Lindblad. Actually, Lindblad qualified second and dropped back all through the race. I don't know quite what happened to Arvin Lindblad. You never know. Well, some... You never know when you just read it whether he's I know, got, but he got a clip on his cooked. wing or something. I know, like yeah, that. some small damage at turn yeah. one, which you don't know about. Um, so it's really good to win for Luke Browning. Um, sprint race. See, this is so hard. Pole man Browning started 12th and finished 11th. So you're thinking, well, should he have done better? Is it that hard to overtake? There's some really good racing up front, actually. But the guy that was, um, was the 10th fastest driver, Kolov, was third on the grid for sprint. Uh, was it Mikola Solov? Sorry, Bulgarians. It's sort of like Nikola Solov. Um he had a really good sprint, but a really good battle. It's a good racing. The, the the front three on the grid had a really good race. What do you it's think? It's actually Solov's second. That's a bit of a Mickey Mouse track because you know, if you look at our video on Love Cards of Tiffany Dale racing Formula Three in 1978, you'll see what a wonderful, glorious, swooping track it was. Now it's very stubborn. It's called, you know, it's three DRSs, isn't it? And then a load of really good corners. I was pointing out in the Formula One, or even Formula Two and Formula Three, you, you could be 0.9 behind starting the lap. And then you've got three straights of DRS and you catch up 0.3 on the first straight, 0.3. And the third straight, you're almost on the Brett's gearbox having caught up the 0.9. Then there's a whole load of fast corners and you lose 0.3, 0.6, 0.9 and you're back where you started. <laughs> the frustrations of DRS. Um, so, yeah, but a quick mention of the Porsche Super Cup. So, watch the whole race. Harry King, who's the, he's, he finished second in the first two rounds and ended up second again to the... And the same guys won all three. So Harry's championship chances are diminishing. But it's just, I mentioned them, mate, the save. If you've got a chance, if anyone's got a recording of the Porsche Super Cup race, after the two fast left-handers in the middle of the track, there's a right-hand, pretty much flat kink that yeah. leads up to the penultimate bend. And there was a, they're all a bit side-by-side side in the opening lap. But he, he, he was slightly squeezed, to be honest, Harry. Uh, a bloke almost onto the curbs of the left right-hand kink. And so this bloke fell out and tapped the back of Harry King's car. You know, Porsche Super Cup car. And he must have been 60 degrees sideways or 40. I mean, the save of the century. He's got some skills. Fast hands. Fast hands, Harry. Uh, and he recovered from this amazing sideways moment to get up to second, but couldn't. The uh, leader by then was long gone. So, so it, was that like one of my tank slappers when I attempt to power slide? Yeah, but he didn't slap. He did the tank, but held it, it held it brilliantly. Just brought the car back to straight ahead, which is so so hard to do on slick racing tyres and with a lot of grip underneath you. So just, yeah, so just, a lot of entertainment. Just, from Austria. just watch Sunshine. that mic a little bit on your your oh, very beautiful shirt. Yeah, there we well, go. I'm getting excited. I'm getting excited about these stories. <laughs> well done, Harry. Um, so away from Austria, let's go off to Poland. Then the World Rally Championship um, still continues to entertain, but. <laughs> It's all about these Toyota part-timers. So Toyota have got their two world championships, former world champion part-timers. One, in fact, the reigning world champion, uh, Gale Rovampera. But it was supposed to be Sebastian Ogier's turn this weekend. But he had this car crash. I don't think it was that. I don't see him. I'm not sure the people are hit with that injury. I, don't, I haven't read any nasty stories. I don't think anyone was badly injured, but little knocks. So all of a sudden, Sebastian Ogier, that had done all the, you know, the uh, reckies and the looking around and getting prepared, the prep, watching your videos from last year's rallies uh, was was deemed not fit enough to do the rally so then they then so then to get the part-timer replaced they phoned out their other part-timer <laughs> who was mucking about with his jet ski or something uh Kelly Rothenpera they brought him to Poland and he goes and wins the flipping rally unbelievable a poor old Elfin Evans you know the <laughs> Toyota mainstay and they don't they don't back off Elfin's the one that should now be finally winning the world championship <laughs> But they don't back off and give him a win. I mean, Elfin Evans finished second in the end, but there was no team orders to say, well, hold on a minute, he's the guy that's supposed to be winning the championship for us this year. 
Um, and he was 28 seconds behind at the end from Cali Rum, but hadn't even prepared to do the rally. He just comes in, flies around. How do they both do it? How do they say Ben? Supremely skillful. It's just yeah. like, you know, Lewis Hamilton and, and Max Verstappen or, or or now Lando Norris and Max Verstappen. They're just the best. They're just so good. Um, it was a shame, actually, for the day that Andrea Mickelson, who's in the third Hyundai, Hyundai. He did so well. Well, he benefited again. It's this, um, you know, running order. There's always a night, these very dusty gravel rallies. Because the championship leader, Thierry Neuville, in the, uh, the factory high and as well you know he has to sweep the road for the first day yeah and i think he lost 30 seconds the leaders in the first day because you just you can't go as quick whereas um uh, andreas you know he was running about sixth or seventh on the road so he had a you know much more swept track made the most of it i mean still you've got to do the driving and he was actually leading on the final day morning he led all that way he, he was been sort of he'd gone back to second and back to first but he was right on the pace and so then a puncture on the first stage of the last day uh, which allowed, I mean, maybe Cali would have got him anyway. They were very close. Um, so Mickelson dropped to six in the end. Um, Evans, lovely, as I said, came second. Lovely, he comes lovely little little interview of him. And uh, the, the, he just couldn't believe it. The, the, they, they sort of thrust the microphone in his face. Who was this? The, um, the Danish lad, Mickelson. And uh, they oh, thrust yeah. the microphone in his face and, you know, you're, you're leading. And he's <laughs> just completely shocked. And he thought he could have gone faster. He, he thought he was taking it easy, but... Yeah. Yeah, Another good, good solid run for Fords. You always have a bad luck, luck, luck of Fords. I mean, this Adrian Formo seems to have matured. He was one of the Frenchmen that used to crash it occasionally and then they'd give him the drive back again. Uh, so good up a third for Ford. And the Hyundai top two, the, 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 the championship challengers, brought Ot Ot Tanak hit a deer that put him out. Nouvelle, I said, um, struggled with the day, road sweeping. I know what other problems he had, but he ended up fourth. Um, but he still leads the championship, Nerville. So it's still Nerville ahead of Evans, ahead of Tanak at the top of the table, all closing up. So it's still an interesting battle. The two Hyundai boys and Evans still grafting away as only Elfin can. He just grafts away, doesn't he? There's a great story. What was the name of it? I can't pronounce it. Another story. Mar Latvian. Martin Sisk, I think that's how it's spelt anywhere. Latvian. They gave him a drive. He's a talented young driver. They, they gave him a... I don't know why they gave him a, a Rally 1 Ford but without the hybrid. So it's obviously a cheaper car or mm. less expensive car to build, but you're allowed to enter this rally by the top class in the same car apart from not having a hybrid. So last year's and, car, I guess. Yeah, well, no, last year they had a hybrid. They had a hybrid uh, for two four, or three yeah. years now. Couple and he finished fifth. He had a really amazing mm. drive with no mistake. He was running second, I think, in the early days because he was also running late, you know, as a no, no point. So he had, he had a clearer road. But again... It's off to Latvia next as well, so maybe he'll shine in his home. Put, you know. Give him a hybrid. Give him a he hybrid. I think he beat the other hybrid, Munster. I think they beat the Belgian into sixth place. Munster's got the hybrid car, so he beat a Ford man that had the hybrid. Entertaining, always on the telly, but you know, always difficult. As you say, it's uh, to just you admire their skills, but can't really see the race going on. But it was tense. MotoGP, right. Moto yeah, Holland. Um, a bit Holland. more Dutch disappointment there. But in terms of the Dutch, let's just go back to Formula 1 quickly because they're, they're <laughs> at Austria. It was like a home race. I know. The orange I love, you know, big respect to them because uh, was, it was orange, a sea of orange. The grandstands full of them. I know, really good. Um, they all left home a bit disappointed. Um, but yes, the MotoGP. It's a bit of a boring MotoGP, I'm afraid, to have to admit. Sorry, Susie. You're not all your races. And this was at the home of Moto Assen, the most... Famous trap for really brilliant dices right down. There's always there's, there's this right, left, right chicane at the end of the lap, and there's always dive bombing overtakes going on to add huge excitement to the huge crowd. But Frank, Frankie Bagnaia on the factory Ducati just dominated the weekend. He won the sprint easily, and they're all spread out in the, in the Grand Prix as well. He, he led home Jorge Martin, who was battling with the championship for. He was in a satellite Premat Ducati, but he has the factory bike. So He's the same bike as Bagnaia's got. And the, and the second factory bike of Enya Bastianini was third. So they really just pulled away. Um, it was a good battle for Ford. The most entertaining racing was the battle for Mark Marquez was in there and all sorts. And DJ and Antonio came fourth in the, in the proper satellite VR6 Ducati. So great stuff. But Jorge Martin's lead, he came second in the sprint race as well. And um, his lead, three, two rounds ago, he had a 39-point lead ahead of Bagnaia. It's now down to just 10 points. Wow. And, of course, there's a bit of tension because um, Jorge Martin didn't get the factory ride that Mark Marquez has got. 
a Bastianini being dropped from the factory too. So Mar Jorge Martin's going to Aprilia next year, so he's leaving Ducati. But of course, for the rest of this year, he's fighting with the Ducati factory for a world championship. So whether he still gets the same bike, obviously there's Ducati saying, of course he will, they're backing each rider the same. But it's pretty tense, I think, in the Ducati tent at the moment. There's a bit of tyre saving going on, a few little, let you know, you go in front of me type thing, which you don't see very often in, in uh, MotoGP. Well, and that was the, the fast, did you see that? That was, that was in the, uh, in fact, it was DG Antonio who was running fourth. I've just realised that. He got back to fourth again on the last few laps. Yeah. And he, he, he literally backed off and let a few people buy him. Which is very rare, to, isn't it? To heat the tyre up. Ah, okay. Not the other way around. Ah, okay. Because they have to do 60% of the race. I only caught a bit of this commentary, so I might not have got the story exactly right. Because they're not allowed, again, it's this problem of you, if you, the lower you go, the tyres, the better grip you've got, but then the, the tyre can puncture and you're stressing the tyre too much. So they have to do at least 60% or 80% of the race with a tyre pressure above a certain threshold. So you can go a bit below for a while, how they monitor this. I mean, it's yeah, scientific. It's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> and apparently they, they sent him a note on his windscreen, on his, not his screen, his dashboard, to say you, 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 you can't go any longer out the front because your tyre's going, um, losing pressure. And so he dropped back to follow bikes to heat the tyre up, which is the problem of following a bike, to get the pressure back up again. So the story went. So, yes, it's, it's complicated racing, isn't it? <laughs> but anyway, a Moto2 was won by the Japanese driver Ai Ogura, but Jake Dixon beginning to come back for some form. We had a crash early in the season. He's been dropping it and not having good results. We had fourth. So that was good. But the, um, the sad story for the Dutch, the other disappointment for the Dutch was their really talented Moto3 driver, Colin Vaya. Um, he, he was on pole for a while. I think he went out for another lap. He had this horrendous high side right in front of the main grand stand, on the start finish line, coming out of the right, left, right uh, chicane that ends it. And he just, just, just back went when he's on full throttle and it pitched him so high in the air. But of course, they dust themselves off. Had a great race, but he was dominating the race. He qualified about third, I think, in the end. A few people did, couldn't improve. Um, but then all of a sudden, he was getting caught hand over fist by his friend Ivan Orotola. And uh, who got him on the last corner of the last lap in front of all the Dutch uh, fans in here. He was very good about it after. He's a lovely guy, lovely character, very open-minded, not angry. They just said, you know, I didn't have anything left. I tried to, you know, pull the pin and get away. He had quite a big lead with three or four laps to go. Uh, the David Alonso, the, the Colombian sensation, he only, he only had a bit of an off weekend. He wasn't good around Assen, finished fifth. Scott Ogden, the best British driver, 17th. He was actually he was battling, you know, better midfield this race than he has done in the, for a while. Josh Watley, 24th. It's not the best of, of, um, of uh, MotoGP. Sorry, Susie. But, you know, it's always good just to see those riders doing the riding. Spa? Yeah, just, just down the road on how yep. far it is from Assen to Spa. The uh, just great stories. <laughs> this, I, I think it's about 67... I was going to write it down, but I forgot I lost out county. About 24 foot. No, I was going to write that down. I didn't. Huge field, huge number of retirements. Uh, 17 safety cars, wind, rain, floods, the usual spa 24 hour race. Uh, and a very dramatic and pretty annoying finish for the Ferrari. Ferrari was leading, had a 50 second lead. Um, and there's just 50 minutes to go. So you're down to the last hour, and you reckon you should be able to do that. Um, no, 10 second lead. So I've got my facts right. He had a 10 second lead from the Aston Martin second. So it was close, 50 minutes to go. And he came in for his last pit stop and there was a broken down Lamborghini blocking the pit entry. In fact, quite a few of those news, I've always wondered whether this would happen, like the, the tunnel at Abu Dhabi and other entries are so narrow mm. that if someone does break down, you can't overtake. And this Ferrari couldn't. And he sat oh, there for wow. 50 seconds, 50 seconds. Wow. Losing the lead and eventually losing the race to the Aston Martin that came through to win GT3 cars. Uh, Nicky Tim, Marco Sorensen and Mattia Drudi were the drivers. Um, the first Aston Martin win in the Spa 24 hours since 1948. Uh, how about <laughs> that? Blimey. I have I no thought... idea what Aston Martin that would have been in 1948. It's a bit of a... Crofty stat that to yeah. make you think. 
I was at Heavingham Concourse on the weekend and they had a uh, Nimrod, which reminded me of you because. Oh, the Aston Martin Nimrod. Which colour was it? Bovis one, was it? Yeah. The, yeah, not, not my factory coloured one. No. That's cool. So, yeah, all sorts of heroic did, stories. Did you see? Class. I think one of the GT cars stalled or there was a problem. Um, um, horrendous, a shunt coming down yeah. the Eau Rouge. Uh, to Eau Rouge. And then, but obviously, there was double yellows, but I didn't see them yeah. because where it's filmed from in the stand. But the speed the cars are still going past. Yeah. Now, everybody that goes past at that sort of speed on double yellows should be banned or reprimanded yeah. or something. That drive, I don't know what they've done to him since the race, but I mean, slow down, be prepared to stop. It wasn't but the, the weirdest him. He, thing. He's was... the one that hit them. He, he's yeah, one that... Others were missing, yeah but, yeah. but funny enough, the two ahead of him stayed next to the pit wall, which was yeah. the obvious and path. He, he and for some the... reason, he suddenly inside, pulled yeah. out, changed lanes. He didn't follow the car in front of him and just whacked into this stationary Ferrari. Short burst of luckily, a very short burst of flames came out the back. But they, but they have to, they have to do something about those sort of things. It happens all too often in it, you know, mm. in, in all sorts of racing. You just don't want to give up a, a couple of seconds, which is crazy, really. But funny enough, in the Formula Three race, Mansell, a German guy, I think, he was, he was running up front in either the main race or the sprint race. I think he was actually leading. With about two laps to go, a tremendous battle, great racing going on. This this was the pack, I think, in the sprint race, and apparently you get a beep in your ear when there might be a yellow safety car, and then then you get a second beep when there is a safety car. And apparently he said he, he said it was his fault completely that he heard the beep and backed off and got overtaken, got jumped jumped to third place before he realised that that was the first beep and not the beep. Wow. Yeah, something like that, which was, so he was too cool. That's the trouble, you see. You have these complicated systems now because they won't slow down for yellow flags. You have to beat them in the ear and you have to put the thing on their dashboard saying, you know, virtual safety car. So um, that, seems, that seems very basic, doesn't oh, no. it? A little beep in the ear, that's super yeah, easy. and he miss. backed off and he just mm. lifted off. And, oh, no, that's not the safety car beep. It's the beep to warn you there might be a safety car. Who's your favourite commentator on, on um, well, I, I think one of the best, uh, Anthony Davidson, no, who 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 do we mention earlier? Was it What's Harry? That? Harry was it's Harry, isn't it? The new Harry, guy. Harry, yeah, Harry was. He was good. He's good. Yes, yeah, solid, good. Alex Brundle, who I rate a lot. He was fantastic. Driver. He was really on the ball this weekend. But you say that, but he made a massive faux pas because he said, and I quote, "I firmly believe that Max Verstappen doesn't know that Lando has just jumped down the outside of him." So he's defending Max Verstappen. When did he say that? He wasn't commentating the race. On the analysis after the race, was he involved? Is, then was he? Well, he's he doing no, he 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 F one TV. He's doing F one TV. So unless you got F one TV, you wouldn't have heard it. But uh, oh, okay. yeah, maybe, I don't know. Maybe he's trying to be controversial. Controversial, but uh, I think he'd be one of the only pundits <laughs> in the world. But, but well, maybe he's right. Maybe Max didn't know, but Max I, should know. Max did bloody know. Well, but, but even if he didn't know, you, you should shouldn't yeah. move to the left. Without okay. looking first, you shouldn't move under braking. He's still That's one of my favorites. Law. So, uh, um, where are we going now? Yeah, Where's... lots of class at Spa. The Barwell team, my brother's Lamborghini team, they were leading the bronze class and had a puncture with an hour and a half to go, but finished third. So, and so many stories like that. Every team probably could have won their class, could have won the race. It's an incredible event. I think it was 67 cars going around Spa. What a shame. Hail and rain. Le, Le Mans and uh, Spa have both had awful weather for, for their 24 hours. Yeah. You, you think summer in Europe would be quite nice. Global warming. Yeah, but it makes it exciting. I wouldn't like it, but it makes, makes it exciting for the teams and sponsors. Yeah, but I always think of the punters. I always think of the people that have to go and watch. and Because 99.9% .9 of people haven't got hospitality. And they're well, out no, there. Pouring rain. 24 no. hours trying to stay motivated and drink <laughs> enough beer to stay warm. But... So all entertaining stuff. I don't know where was the best. Well, the Formula One was the most entertaining, only because of the big controversy. So MotoGP was a bit disappointed. Spa was entertaining its own GT3 way. Hang on. Uh, we great commentary. To... John Watson. And we got the final, you know. John Watson is always as well with David Anderson, wasn't it? On the on the GT3 um, commentary. What he's really good. He's very funny. Um, and then your NASCAR. Of course, there was NASCAR at Nashville. And it's funny. It was one of those sort of races which ended... Uh, almost farcically, but had been a really good race because we had a. It was a, there weren't many accidents, not many yellows around. There were a few lots spinning out. How big's the um, track? How big's the circuit? I think it's a one and a half mile or probably a mile and a half oval. But quite a few of the lead, It was such a tricky track. 
and quite a few just were spinning out. I mean, the yellows do come out, but not actually hitting anything. Some of them hit, some of them hit the wall. Um, but they were right towards the end. There was a really Ross Chastain, the melon man, melon smashing man, was being slowly caught by dirty Denny Hamlin. <laughs> ooh, ooh. Really, um, it was just two of them out front. And Hamlin closed him down and took about five laps to eventually overtake him. They run side by side for the corners and the edge back in front. And about five seconds behind them was a similar battle for third place going on between Kyle Larson and Kyle Busch. Again, joking, you know, really good, just proper racing to one on one. Uh, and Hamlin eventually got the lead with about two laps to go or three laps to go. It looked like Hamlin would win it. The Ross Chastain was still trying to fight back. And they, was, they tried different lines every lap. You know, they'll try to go low, go high. You know, they'll, they'll try to find a little bit of edge. So it was sort of high tech, really good driver against driver. And so with two laps to go in the classic, um, the two car, I forget his name, Cedric, isn't it? Spun out and out came the safety cars. So now everybody's all queued up together. And by now, the other tension in the air, because even before the, the, the two laps to go crash, they were talking to Denny Hamlin about fuel, because they'd all pitted just to get to the finish line on the, on the original number of laps. And now, of course, you've got to have two more laps. You've got to do the green-white checker, plus cruising around while the pace car gets sorted. So there's so much talk about running out of fuel and everything else. And I think they must have then had about three green white checkers, three more yellows. Um, Kyle Last, in fact, right behind Denny Hamlin on the first restart, made a bit of a mistake and slid up. And poor old Ross Chastain, uh, who was half a length ahead of Last, Last and put him in the wall. Out come the yellows. That's Chastain crossed off the list. <laughs> then another restart, Last had run out of fuel. He was now on the front row alongside Hamlin, so we're expecting a bit of Hamlin versus Last in action. And poor Kyle Bush, right behind Last. Um, got put out and got hit from, and he was in the wall because Larson ran out of fuel right in front of him. You're all trying to accelerate to start racing again. So that was um, Carl Bush out. Then there were more yellows. <laughs> so now poor old Hamlet had to come in for fuel, having dominated the last, last few laps. He just couldn't risk staying out. So Hamlet came in for fuel. Um, Larson limped back and got fuel. And then there was one more green white checker, and Joey Logano uh, got the win. Uh, close towards the end so you know I think Larson got back to 8th and Denny Hamlin got back to 12th having pitted and refueled but Larson's already through isn't he with this last 16 yeah, they're all yeah they've all got yeah. wins they but yeah. there's, there's still a point because if you win the points championship which is ends somewhere on my blackboard I don't know when it begins they've got quite a few more rounds it's getting close towards a couple of little dots got Daytona they got about four more races before before the, the playoffs but if you lead the points championship you get 12 bonus points for the playoffs so it moves you up the league so it's still quite a good talent to win the points championship so they're still they're still all going for everything even though they're through to the playoffs they still want the points so it was, it was one of those you know it was entertaining when you get four green white checkers and crashes everywhere you, it almost looks a bit silly um you just, and it's just it was just the contrast between a real race you know between two drivers trying everything to to overtake and, and go for the flag to then this sort of whole pack just go mental that's nascar boy boy that's nascar <laughs> you never and know next, what's gonna happen and next week there's a there's a little oh, race going on somewhere isn't there we did we did a two-hour podcast next week and i'll be i'll be exhausted after four days at silverstone you're going with um, motor passion three days you're motor entertaining the guests and he's telling Ollie Behrman's guests on Friday, so I'm looking forward to that. And we hope we might get Ollie into the box for a chat and um, hoping there might be any announcement maybe as well, maybe at the British Grand Prix we might be even excited about with the Behrman fan club. So you're there the whole um, four days or three days? No, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I'm there Friday, Saturday. with Thursday, I'm at Wimbledon. I'm doing the tennis at Wimbledon oh, Thursday. Wow. So I'm a Big sporty week. Sporty. Somebody... I'm, with Sh I'm with Skoda. Did you know there was a Formula One? No. <laughs> so... So having been at Silverstone all week, I think we might have to do our podcast on the Tuesday because I could come happen. home. We have, next weekend, we have uh, British Formula 1, Formula 2, Formula 3 and Porsches. Watch out for Harry King. Go, Harry, go. We have IndyCar, uh, Ohio, Ohio, wonderful and undulating, a real little uh, tough track to overtake, but really great to watch the cars. 
We had a lovely story that came up on Twitter. Toby Sowery, who did British Formula 3 about, I don't know, eight years ago. He's 29 years old now, you know, dreamed of being a Grand Prix driver. Uh, hadn't got the budget. Went to America to try and, you know, as so many drivers are doing, to, to get an eke out some sort of professional life. And he's, he's doing GT3s and he's doing some LMP2s. So he's, he's, he's earning money as a racing driver. We had a test with IndyCar. I don't know how he organized. He's obviously got some sponsors that you need to buy test days and stuff. He had a test, I think, with them. I forget which team. Anyway, he's got a drive this weekend at Ohio at the IndyCar race. It might be the only one he ever does. But, you know, just that dream you had, you know, to get to the top step and to me, you know, IndyCar is as big a top step as Formula One almost. You know, it's the top of the American tree. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, he won't have any testing hardly and he'll be in an IndyCar racing round the field. So good luck to Toby Sowery at the Indy this weekend. World Endurance Championship also on this week is Sao Paulo in Brazil. I think that's still there. Uh, MotoGP's at the Sashkin Ring, that amazing, um, real tough little track going left-handed. It's a huge crowd. Um, Aussie supercars are out somewhere down under. The NASCAR boys are going around somewhere as well. I've got all the tracks. I'm back home. If you can't be bothered to watch the telly all weekend, there's the British Superbikes at Snetterton. So if you live out that way. Go for a day out. But, yeah, we've got a lot to talk about next week, not least the repercussions of the new rules and the drivers' conferences of how people look back. at the We, we will be here next Monday, so don't listen to Tiff saying he's going to have a day off on Monday. We'll see you next week, next Monday. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Bye, Yeri. <laughs>